Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this session once again. We thank you for your spirit always available. And we thank you for the revelation you always give us. And Lord, we pray, we'll not take your word for granted in Jesus' name. The chance we have. The privilege we have. The revelation you are making known unto your people. Blessed are our eyes for what we see. And blessed our lives for what we experience. And Lord as we come to this chapter in the book of Joshua. Lord we pray you will put your fire power in every one of us in Jesus name. The passion to rise and obey. The passion to rise and do what you've called us to do. The passion not to withhold anything from you, but to move on and to do everything you call us to do. Grant to us in Jesus' name. And Lord, every operation you need to perform in the heart. So that, Lord, we'll leave all our burdens behind. And then we move on. And we're able to accomplish and do what you've called us to do. Give that to us in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray at this time that you speak to us personally. One by one. In our hearts. So that, Lord, we'll be able to rise up. In the strength over the wings on the wings of the eagle. And then we move on and fly over all mountains and rivers and obstacles. And they were able to accomplish with this single life what you've called us to accomplish. Do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, not to allow the tiredness of the body to hinder us from the quickening of the spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another amen. amen. We come in a series of studies of Joshua. It's very interesting as you look at Joshua. And sometimes when you look at the illustrations that we give, then it impresses you and makes you to know what you're supposed to do. So that you'll be able to move on without any hindrance. Let's say it this way. Look up here. When you were a baby, you had no concern. You had no care. You had no experience. You had no disappointment. And everything you did, you did with all your heart. Because there was no concern. When you smiled to a stranger that came to visit the family. It was the broadest smile the stranger, the visitor ever saw. And when you cried, asking for the attention of mommy. You cried and you cried with all your heart. You didn't care what people will say or think. You had no concern. Because you see, when you become like a baby like that, and there is no concern, and you're not carrying a baggage with you, whatever you do, whether you cry or smile or laugh or shout or just, in fact, that baby, when she wants to bite mommy, see, why didn't you bring the source of milk out in time? When she was going to bite her, she was biting her with all her strength. And say, mommy, learn a lesson and bring the milk next time when I need it. You know those children, no concern, no care. But you know when you begin to grow up in life, you begin to play with other children. With toys. Then they begin to disappoint you. And then you begin to have care and sorrow. And then there's a little load at your back. And then you go to school. As you go to school, then you meet a lot of other disappointments. And the loads are increasing. Now you smile with moderation. 
Now your heart with caution. And then your steps are getting slower. And then you get to secondary school, a teenager. And then you begin to see what other people are doing. And then the other side. I mean, if you're a boy, the girls. If you're a girl, the boys. They begin to maybe call you names or something. And then your load is bigger. And then you cannot walk freely anymore. And, and it's you. It's you. It's just the load on your back. And then you come to life. You've gone to high school. Disappointments upon disappointments. And this load is not very big. And if you, and then you like to talk about the load, uh, really, about the burden. Anybody you meet, you know what I'm going through. Sometimes in the valley, sometimes in the mountain. And all this I'm going through. And the more, more you talk about it, the bigger the load comes. And then uh, your steps are slow. Your smiles are calculated. Your actions are with great caution. And there is a place you cannot go. They will kill me there. And there is another place you cannot turn to. They will frown at me there. And there are some people you cannot touch. You cannot, you cannot relate with because they don't agree with me. The Lord is much. And then if you are in the ministry. And you have such a load. And the load is on your back. And the load is on your face. And the load is on your mind. And the load is on your heart. You'll be dragging your feet. And there's no way you can carry out the divine vision. The heavenly revelation with such a load on your mind. And such a load on your back. There comes a point then in your life. You ask yourself, this single life I have. What will it amount to? This single life I have. What will I achieve with it? Because you know, you have distributed your energy. Part of your energy is giving to the enemy. Part of your energy is not seeing your wounds. Part of your energy is bearing your body. Part of your energy is taking care of the day-to-day -day things that come as pressure upon your life. Part of your energy is devoted to kind of enduring the burden of life. Part of your energy then, what remains, maybe about 6%, 7% is now remaining to carry on the vision of life. That's why as we come to Joshua chapter 5. These children of Israel, they were carrying something from the wilderness. That is something in their heart, something in their life. And it was revealed by the uncircumcision. And the Lord said, you have a lot ahead of you. And if you're going to be able to do that, if you're going to be able to move on without any strings attached to your feet, and without anything tying your hand. And without anything a burden in your heart. And without anything a reproach of the Gentiles. Without anything that will be tying you down. All the fetters to be broken. All the chains to be destroyed. If you're going to be free to fly. You must come to Gilgal. And as you get to Gilgal. There will be circumcision. And it is after that circumcision, all the care, all the burden, all the reproach of uncircumcision is taken away. And now the sky will be the limit. That's why we come. And as you are here, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about the journey ahead of you. The work ahead of you. The Jericho walls ahead of you. I cannot imagine Joshua looking at Jericho, looking at the Canaanites, looking at the Hivites, looking at the Jebusites, and looking at all the enemy nations before him and what he was to conquer. I cannot imagine Joshua getting involved with some minor, minor annoyances. Getting involved with some minor, minor provocations and dividing his energy and giving 86% of the 
of his life, of his energy, of his ability, of his intelligence, of his planning, of his knowledge, given 86% of the qualities that he had, giving it to some personal, private misgivings, injuries, and then leaving him with only 14% to go over to Jericho. Will not have been reading the stories who have been reading, but when all the bodies are dropped, when all the things that are personal are laid aside, and there is circumcision, and now you're free. You're free in your heart. You're free in your soul. You're free in your mind. You're free in your body. You're free in your sight, in your vision. And you look like this, and there is nothing blocking your view. And you can see, you can see the end, and you can see the result, and the reward, and you can see the victory at the end of the road. And then you glue your eyes, you gaze on that victory, and nothing distracts you here, nothing distracts you here. And I say, Joshua, tell me your secret, because I want you to teach me something in this Congress. Oh, Joshua said, it's very simple. You see, do you look at, look at that elephant there, over there? Yes, uh, Joshua, I can't see very well, but since you say it's there, I can see you say it's there. And Joshua said, I'm looking for that elephant, that big nation, mightier than the nation of Israel. And then I said, what are you telling me? Then he said, there's a mosquito here that is bothering me. There's a rat here that is bothering me. If I look away from the elephant, I look at the mosquito and I look at the rat here. I'm going to miss the elephant. Let the mosquitoes have their hey day, their glorious day. And let them bite all they want. I don't want them to distract me from the elephant. I'm going for the elephant. The Lord is telling you tonight go for the elephant and all the little little mosquitoes all the little little rats all the little little things get circumcised and when you are circumcised all those little little things will matter no more because you have an elephant, a mighty nation, missionaries, here we are. You have a whole nation that you are the overseer of. And you need the power, you need the anointing, you need the breakthrough that will help you in this new year and get that nation. That's the elephant. And then we come over here and the water to bath is not enough. And the food does not go around. Missionary. And then we we'll say, look at what they are doing here. And there is not enough water. And there is, get circumcised. And keep your eyes on the elephant. And we who are overseers here. Millions of people waiting for us crusades that you can hold having the power the power of the world to come and blowing down with the mighty power of God from the throne of the universe to make to make sure that all the Jericho walls are falling that's your elephant and then we come here who took my bible from this place and put it over there are you the one sitting there took my bible did you know i put my bible there for a reason and then you're all ruffled you're all unhappy because they took your bible from here and they put it here and yet you have a whole state a whole region of millions of people waiting for you keep your eyes on the elephant and don't bother about these mosquitoes and all these rats all these little things get circumcised. And when you get circumcised, all these things amount to nothing. We're going to get the elephant. And we're going by the grace of God. We're going to achieve something. You know, that's how to achieve. If we just get circumcised. Many people don't understand this thing we're talking about. The circumcision. The sanctification. They have come again. The holiness. Is to free you up. 
is to take away from your nature and take away from your heart and take away from your mind and take away from your surrounding anything that will tie you down and then you will fly like an eagle and your eyes you have the vision the eyes of the eagle and you can see and you know this is where i am going and the little little things bother you no more let's come to joshua chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 1 in joshua chapter 5 we're reading from verse 1 and it came to pass when all the kings of the amorites which were on this on the side of jordan westward and all the kings of the canaanites which were up by the sea heard that the lord had dried up the waters of jordan from before the children of israel until we were passed over that their heart melted neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of israel what a verse and if you read that verse if that were to apply to you you will say this is the time we must move on now but look at what followed and at that time at the time when the hearts of the children of israel of the children of the canaanites melted when in the enemy camp there was terror and there was fear and i was dread and they melted and fainted because of them at that time the lord said unto joshua make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of israel the second time lord isn't this the best time to strike the iron while it is hot lord isn't this the best time when the canaanites are so much afraid of us and their hearts have melted to move on and move in immediately if we circumcise all these men they become weak and they have sore and they cannot move they cannot walk what if all those canaanites will take that as a time of opportunity for them and then they pounce on us and they destroy us what will be our future thank god for joshua he never used his common sense when the supreme god of heaven speaks he never reasoned when the sovereign will of god is revealed he never debated when the declaration of the almighty god came to him when the lord when the message comes to you never say why but let faith and duty respond just obey just obey and here we find joshua that at this time when the opportunity was there to move on and joshua made him sharp knives immediately joshua this is what to do lord look at jericho walls don't think about that now make sharp knives and circumcise there's something to cut off from the children of israel you know my brothers and sisters it may be a small thing a small thing to cut off in our lives a small thing that will release us and the lord is saying take a sharp knife and circumcise the children of israel and you know it was joshua the lord spoke to and we're learning from this book the lord did not speak to the generality of the people the lord speaks to our leader he speaks to me and then he instructs me and guides me that there's something to cut off from your life and maybe while you are there you're thinking of your ability your skill your gifts your talent you're thinking of the responsibility and the duty the challenge the things to do and you're saying we're ready and i'm saying wait god said we should take sharp knives and cut off cut off 
cut off. Circumcise. Now, if you understand circumcision, if you take the whole body of a little baby, the fingers, the toes, the tongue, the flesh, circumcision only takes away a small part of the body of that child. Not up to 1%. It's a small thing. And yet, it must be done. You know, sometimes, when you look at the whole thing, look at everything we've got. And look at the small thing that the Lord is saying, take a sharp knife, cut it off. Except you cut it off, we cannot move on. But the church is eager. Let's move on. We have the power, we have the challenge, we have the vision, and we have the Jericho walls ahead. This is a mighty army. Don't waste time. Wait. Look at our ability. Look at our skill. Look at everything we've got. Wait. There's something to cut off. And until it is cut off, we cannot move on. That's what the Lord is teaching us here. It's a very small part of the body. Very small. Not up to 1%. If you divide the body to 1,000 parts, the part the Lord is saying you cut off in circumcision is not up to 1 over 1,000. Very negligible, but you must cut it off. That's what the Lord is saying. And if we don't get the lesson, we're going to stay on this side. Yes, the miracle of dividing river Jordan has taken place. If we don't get the lesson, we're going to stay on this side of Jericho for a long time. God is never in a hurry. We have waited for 40 years already, Joshua. What are we going to do now? We're not going to be like the old generation that will not do what the Lord is calling us to do. Cut it off. And in that Joshua chapter 5, reading from verse 3, and Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the first kings. As I look at this, if you have the program in your hand, the topic is consecration and sanctification before conquest. The first subtitle, prescription of circumcision before conquest. Prescription of circumcision before conquest. Number two, provision of corn in Canaan. We'll get to that later. Provision of corn in Canaan. Number three, preeminence of the captain of Conqueror. Preeminence of the captain of Conqueror. Number one, prescription of circumcision before conquest. As we read this, you'll see what the Lord was prescribing. Telling them, this is the urgent thing. This is the immediate thing. This is the non-negotiable Israel. And the Lord told them why the circumcision was necessary. It says in verse 4, This is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt. That were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. The men of war. Are you learning something from this almighty God? Don't we need this men of war to fight our battles for us? Why don't you excuse their murmuring and excuse their complaining? Why don't you excuse all these, their moral laxities? Why don't you excuse all these things that you don't approve of? We need the men of war. And that's what church always thinks. We need this section. Why don't you overlook the murmuring? Overlook the grumbling? Overlook the moral flaws? We need this section. No, God doesn't think that way. And all those men of war, those men, they were already circumcised. 
but the peril of circumcision without obedience the peril of circumcision without holiness the peril of circumcision without yieldedness and surrender to the almighty god even though they were circumcised men of war was skill was talent was ability you know sometimes people cannot understand a person like me because you see there are people that will exalt ability and skill development development of skill to do this or do that and then if i observe a moral flaw and the people are not willing to correct the moral flaw i just bypass that skill that ability and then people say we have a lot of talents in the church why don't we make use of them we cannot if they hold on to their moral flaw we cannot and i'm expecting that you leaders will learn from me that will put god as the all in all those men of war that came out of egypt they died in the wilderness because they, of their murmuring they're grumbling they're complaining and their moral flaw that were not willing to correct and then after they have died it remained only this younger generation and this younger generation had not been circumcised that's the reason for this circumcision now and it's a prescription of that circumcision before conquest in the land of canaan let me read that verse 4 again this is the reason there's a cause why joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of egypt that were males even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of egypt now all the people that came were circumcised but all the people that were born in the wilderness those are the people remaining now by the way as they came forth out of egypt them they had not circumcised in verse 6 for the children of israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people all the people that were men of war which came out of egypt were consumed all the people that came out of egypt which were men of war you know those people they didn't understand their training for warfare was not a war with moses was not a war with aaron but that's what they thought they used the experience in warfare conflict development they used it against moses save your breath save your energy save the ability of warfare a need will come to that when we get to canaan don't misuse that training of warfare against moses or aaron that's what they did against the way of the lord were to fight the enemy not the leader were to fight satan not the servant of god and because of that we did not realize it says in that verse 6 because in the middle because they obeyed not the voice of the lord unto whom the lord swear that he would not show them the land which the lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land that flow with milk and honey and their children whom he raised up in their stage them joshua circumcised 
They had not been circumcised. I was thinking about this. The excitement of getting to the land of promise. The excitement of moving on to possess the land. And then they waited for so long. And God must even should be in a hurry. I've given you the land. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon. That have I given unto you. Arise and go into the land. And divide the land unto them. And while they were rising up. Let's go and possess. Wait. Circumcise yourself. Circumcision. Isn't that outdated already? From Genesis chapter 17, long ago. No, it's the commandment of God. And God is not outdated. And this is the token of the covenant, the circumcision. And it is only when that circumcision is done, you'll be able to move in into the land of promise. And they were told in that verse 7, their children will be raised up in their stage. Them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. In verse 8, and it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, without exception, when all the circumcision are taking place, all the people, all the people, God, is it not enough to circumcise 90% of the people? Why are we wasting time? Because 10% are not circumcised. Yes, let's move on. God said, no. I'm dealing with the whole body. And all the workers who are here, all the leaders who are here, God wants us all circumcised. Otherwise, I told you in that illustration, we we'll are carrying this load in the heart. All these misgivings in the heart. We'll be dividing our energy. And we'll, feel, we'll be feeling, don't you understand? Before somebody is circumcised, even though that little part of the body is there and it's just a little part, every food you take, all the energy you have, it, it has to transmit blood as well as all the nutrients to all the cells of the body. Even that part which you have taken away. You know, all the things in your mind. If you are not circumcised, if they are not taken away, all the energy you have, all the ability you have, this one will take its part. This one will take its part. What will remain will be very small for the real job the Lord has for you. That's why the circumcision is necessary for every part of the body. And then it says, when he had circumcised them, verse 9, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. What? You mean we ate all the manna, and yet we still had the reproach of Egypt? You mean that we had the water out of the rock, the miracles, the signs and the wonders, and we still have the reproach of Egypt? Do you mean that we looked at the ark, and the river Jordan divided, and we passed over, and we still have the reproach of Egypt? Yes, there is something circumcision will do that no other miracle will do. That's what the Lord was telling them, and that's what the Lord is telling us this day. Now, in this verse 9, this day, have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Genesis chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 7. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. Now you must remember, this was the first place where God gave the land to Abraham and to his descendants. And then it was at that time when God gave him the land by promise that he also said, you must be circumcised and your son and your descendants. You understand then, before they could enter into that land of promise, the circumcision was necessary. And we have a land of promise. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land of success. 
a land of achievement, a land of accomplishment, a land of harvest. And if we're going to enter into that land, the Lord is demanding there will be circumcision. Genesis chapter 17 verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. And thy seed after thee. In their generations. Plural. In their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee. And to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee. And to thy seed after thee. The land wherein thou art a stranger. And all the, and all the land of Canaan. For an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham. Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore. Thou and all thy seed after thee. In their generations. Generations in the plural. This is my covenant. Which ye shall keep. Between me and you. And thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. The circumcision was given. The token, the sign of a covenant relationship with the Lord that was already established at the time the promise of the land was given to them, to Abraham, and then to the generations after. That's why at this time now it was necessary. But the Lord made them understand. The circumcision is not just in the physical. Yes, the physical one must be done. And then the real spiritual part of the circumcision. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16. Circumcise therefore. The first king of your heart. You want to get into the land. Circumcise therefore. The first king of your heart. You want to get to the land of fruitfulness. Circumcise therefore. The first king of your heart. And be no more Steve Ned. You know the implication of that. If you are uncircumcised, you'll be stiff necked. When you are circumcised, you will no more be stiff necked. What does that mean? Stiff necked. The neck being stiff. That's what it means. Looking in this direction. And then the Lord is using a servant to call you. The servant is there. And he's saying, hey. Turn around here. Look at me. Let's talk face to face. The neck is teeth. Cannot move. Cannot turn. Cannot change. When the Lord is sending to us plain and clear, this is the will of God. This is what you do. And we're facing this direction. And the man of God is saying, by the word of the Lord, and the prophet of the Lord is saying, by the vision from on high. And the pastor, our shepherd, is saying, by the truth of scripture. It's not that way you are looking at. Turn around. Look in this direction. And you keep your eyes there. Didn't you hear? After message number one. Message number two. Message number three. And you keep your eyes glued in that direction. Can you turn your neck? No pastor. My neck is chief. You won't get into the land. The land of promise. Circumcise therefore. The first king. Of your heart. That ye be no more. Stiff neck. When the circumcision takes place. There will be no stiff neck anymore. 
And that's what the Lord is waiting for. It says, Joshua, take a sharp knife and circumcise the people. And then the Lord is telling us the implication of that, the meaning of that, is that the stiff neck will go after the circumcision. And then we will be able to move on and march on into the promised land. Are we not to read the Bible? Are we not to interpret the Bible? Are we just to come here and be like nominal Christians and nominal workers, nominal leaders and nominal preachers? Are we not to say, this is the Bible. Circumcise therefore the first king of your heart and be no more stiff necked and that is what is required before the people will be ready for the Jericho walls to fall down before them. And you know all these announcements we have been making. That a congress should not look like a general retreat. Where we are preaching. And the people will not allow us to preach. Even our ordinary service on Sunday looks better than this one. That even when you have Christians and unbelievers join together in the normal service, we're still able to preach and there's quietness and there's orderliness. And then there is obedience to the word of God. But you come to leadership strategy congress. And then you find somebody there doing some funny things. Somebody there doing some funny things. This is stiff neck. And the Lord is saying, we should circumcise ourselves. And then when that circumcision takes place, we'll not be applauding people who are in open rebellion. I've never found that in a church that believes the Bible. That, you know, some, some people there or some people off stage here on the stage that they will deliberately do something that will ridicule the service of the Lord. And then the people, their leaders in a strategy congress will applaud them and praise them, congratulate them for their stiff neck. I've never found that where the spirit of God is in control. And then the leader is underneath, belittled. And then the other people that are stiff-necked, they are the exalted people. How can that be? That's why the Lord said, Joshua, yes, I want to make the Jericho walls fall before you, but... Take a sharp knife and circumcise the people. We'll be circumcised. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. Thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. But, look at verse 6. Yes, he wants to give you the land. He wants to make you enter and possess the land of promise. But, in verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. You see that that's exactly what the Lord wants. We'll do what the Lord wants. I say we'll do what the Lord wants. This our neck will not be stiff again. Give me a good amen. amen. I will not be praising the evil doers. In the church. If you find anybody doing something that is wrong. Disturbing the spirituality of the congregation. 
of the leadership congress you'll not be praising them applauding them encouraging them teaching them giving them arms ammunition tools to do it you'll pinch them don't you love god don't you love us for us to get the best in the congress here what are you doing like that when I say it and you say it and we all say it to them, they're in the minority. They'll change. And then the stiff neck will go. And the Lord will be able to get us to the land because we're going to get to the land. Yeah. This year is a year of possession. It's a year when we move in and then we get everything the Lord wants us to get on condition. The circumcision. I come to point number two. Provision of corn in Canaan. Joshua chapter 5. Reading from verse 10. In Joshua chapter 5 verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal. And kept the Passover. On the fourteenth day of the month at evening. In the palms of Jericho. Place of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover on living cakes and parched corn in the self same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow. And the manna ceased on the morrow. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither are the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Here we find the discovery. They had been eating manna for about 40 years now in the wilderness. But now they came into the land. The Lord told them already. And he told them, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And all you need, all the corn you need, all the meat, all the bread you need, you're going to find there. And as they go to that land, then the manna stopped. And now you add the corn in the land that, that they will get. Provision of corn in Canaan. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter 5. The provision that is now made available for us. First Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven left the whole lamb? Put out therefore. The old leaven, that he may be a new lamb, a sea unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread. Of sincerity and truth. Now they ate the unleavened bread. And the Lord provided for them. The Lord will provide for us. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Reading from verse 19. Philippians 4 verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Will he do it? He cannot fail. Joshua chapter 5. The preeminence of the captain of conquest. The preeminence of the captain of conquest. Joshua chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold 
there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Once again, a leader must be bold and courageous. Here is Joshua. And the people had been circumcised. And the Lord had given them corn in the land. All the manna is now gone. It's a new day, a new era, a new time, a new epoch, a new generation. And the old is gone. The old manna is gone. A new scene. They just enjoyed the provision of this new corn. And then... He, lift, he lifted up his eyes and he saw a man with the sword drawn. And he didn't tremble. He saw his sword in his hand. And he wanted to know his identity. Who are you? Are you for us or for our adversaries, for our enemies? Where do you stand? Who are you joining your strength with? Bold. And courageous bold and courageous that's what a leader ought to be you don't see somebody with a sword drawn and then you draw a conclusion ask questions and in verse 14 and he said nay but as the captain of the host of the lord am i now come as the captain of the host of the lord am i now come and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What says my Lord unto his servant? Who is this? Captain of the Lord of hosts. Number one, he is not a man like Joshua. How do we know that? Because he worshipped him. If he was a man like Joshua, he shouldn't worship him. Do you remember when Cornelius fell down and worshipped Peter? He said, get up. I'm a man like you are. A man should not worship another man. So number one, he's not a man like Joshua. Number two, he was not an ordinary angel. What? How could you say that? Do you remember Revelation? After the angel had revealed all those great things and deep things unto John, he fell down at the feet of the angel. And the angel said, see that you do it not. I'm just an angel. And I'm just like a servant like you. Worship God. If he wasn't a man and he wasn't an angel, who is this? This is Christ. I said this is Christ. He appeared before his incarnation. And he said, I come as a captain of the Lord, of the host of the Lord. And then Joshua, on hearing that, he fell down and he worshipped him. And he says, what says my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord so said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. Where did you hear that before? At the burning bush. When God the Father, when Jehovah in heaven, and the strong one, the El Shaddai, the mighty God, when he met Moses, at the burning bush, Moses, Moses, because Moses was inquisitive, I want to see this burning bush, why it is burning and the bush is not consumed. It says, this is holy ground. Remove your shoes from your feet. This is sacred place. That was almighty God. Here is God, the son. I and my father are one. He is the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. Says Jesus. He is Alpha and Omega. And Christ says, I'm Alpha and Omega too. This is Christ telling Joshua the same thing that Almighty God had told Moses. And then he said, For the place whereon thou standest is holy. The same thing that Jehovah said. Unto, unto his master, unto his leader, unto Moses. And Joshua 
did so, the Lord will go along with us. He is the captain of the host of the Lord. And he has a sword drawn in his hand. He will conquer our enemies for us. He will rout and destroy all the enemies on our behalf. And we're going to be victorious in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things. And by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He is the captain of the host of the Lord. He is for us. He is not for our enemies. He is on our side. And with his sword, he will destroy all the works of darkness. With his sword, he'll destroy all the enemies of righteousness. With his sword, he will destroy all the opposers of the people of God. With his sword, he'll totally cut off all the people that oppose the way of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does judge, does he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses. And clothed in fine linen, clean, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. There's a captain. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That was it. He shall smite the nations. You remember the seven nations in the land of Canaan? Mightier nations than Israel. You remember this captain of the host of the Lord went before them with the sword drawn and is to give assurance to Joshua and to give assurance to the officers and the priests and to give assurance to the people that the captain of the Lord's host is going before them with the sword drawn and he will not withdraw that sword until all those enemies are conquered. Our enemies are conquered. Amen. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That was it. He shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And then in verse 16, and he has on his vesture and on his tie a name reaching King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Tonight I want to assure you, if your heart is circumcised, if you are no more stiff-necked, and if you give yourself wholly and unreservedly unto the Lord, and if you are willing to join hands and heart with the people of God, and you say, yes, we're moving on. We're going to the land of promise, the land of accomplishment this year, the land of fruitfulness this year, and the land of soul winning and evangelism this year, and the land of the fulfillment of the promise of God this year, the captain is going before us. We're not going to look back. We're not going to weaken and we're not going to, you know, cower out. We're not going to chicken out. We're going to follow the captain of our salvation and victory. is sure for every one of us this year in Jesus' name. 
Why don't you rise a wire? So just sitting down, sitting and thinking that victory will come. That you will conquer. It's when you rise up and then you say, Lord, I know you are the captain of my salvation. And the captain of the host of the Lord. And we're following on, we're following through. It's then, it's then the power of the Lord will walk with you. And then you join your heart, you join your mind, you join your soul, you join your intention, you join your vision. Well, the vision, the intention, the heart, the mind of the people of God. We are not divided, all one body we. And we're going together, united. We're going together, united, in agreement together. Agreement on the doctrine. Agreement on worship. Agreement on sanctification. Agreement on holiness. Agreement on circumcision. Agreement on submission. Submission to the word and submission to leadership. It's as we get into that agreement, then in unity, we march on, we move on. The captain of the host is before us. The captain of the host is before us. Is leading the way. But he tells us before you cross over, yes, the, the Jordan River is divided. But before you move on, before you move on into that land of promise, and before the Jericho walls will fall, before you get circumcised, younger generation of leaders, get circumcised, get circumcised. Chief neck is not of God, it's of self, it's related to carnality. Eventually, if it's not of God, it's of Satan. Don't glory in it, don't glory in it. If you are bold, use your boldness against Satan, not against scripture. If you are courageous, use your courage. Against the Canaanites, not against Joshua, and be circumcised. And that little thing, that little part that the Lord is repeating over and over. And He says, Get rid of this, get rid of that. Be obedient to the Lord and come before the Lord and say, Lord, here am I circumcision of heart circumcision of heart and let the lord do it after you lay yourself on the altar after you turn your neck and it's no more stiff neck after you yield after you surrender after you turn around after you tell him i'm sorry i don't want to be a stumbling block I want to be a stepping stone to blessing. And then you tell the Lord, I need the circumcision. Without the circumcision, all the skills are nothing. All the ability, natural ability is nothing. All the gifts are nothing. All the service is nothing. Without the circumcision, gift plus stubbornness destroys the value of that gift skill ability plus stiff neck destroys the skill makes the ability useless and worthless and if you're going to be useful in this army marching on to the promised land here is what the lord is asking that will take the sharp knife and you're circumcised. Let the Lord do it after you've done your part. Might just be a small thing, a little extra flesh, some little works of the flesh that the Lord is saying, Look at this one, spot out this one. Get rid of this one and be no more stiff neck. There's a Bible church. We believe the Bible. Believe it with us. The Bible is against stiff neck. There's a Bible church. 
Believe the Bible with us. Circumcise the heart. Take away all hypocrisy. This is a leadership congress. Strategy congress. To develop strategies on how to move on. Don't turn it into a common meeting, common retreat. Let's have some, some level of leadership, seriousness, commitment, dedication, consecration, self-denial, submission, humility, circumcision of heart. Sanctification, a great Christian experience, a glorious Christian experience. Jesus shed his blood, he gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. How peculiar are we here? Peculiar, different. From general public meeting. Purify unto himself. A peculiar people. Zealous of good works. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. That he might cleanse and sanctify it. Sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word that he might present it unto himself. A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's his desire for his church. That's his desire for his leaders. Circumcision. Sanctification. Submission of the heart to the Lord. The yieldedness of heart and life unto the Lord. The giving of yourself unto the Lord. Not my will. Thy will be done. Not my way. Your way is right. Not my wisdom. Your wisdom. So to guide me to the promised land. Not what I want. But what you demand. Almighty God. Surrender yourself to the Lord. Give yourself to the Lord. Let this circumcision be complete once and for all. Circumcision once and for all. Then that will make this year a year of possession. A year of achievement. A year of accomplishment. All this baggage you are carrying, all this body you are carrying is unnecessary. Drop it. So you can give all your energy. So you can give all your strength. So you can give all your skill and training. To accomplishing what the Lord has called you to accomplish in this new year. And make it a year, a year of possession, a year of achievement, a year of harvesting, a year of glorious entrance into the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Cross over Jordan. Set up the memorials and the monuments. 
of the blessings and the miracle working power of God. And then after that, we get circumcised in readiness to get into the land. Yes, the Lord will do it. Yes, he's eager to get us into the land. Yes. He's eager to make us enter into that land of promise. Flow with milk and honey. Where the grapes of Eskol grow. Others have missed it. They've died in the wilderness. And this younger generation, they are to enter. But they must be circumcised before they enter. And just a little thing, just a short thing. We're circumcised and now we can move on. Circumcised and then we can move on. Promise the Lord. That old carnality will never come back again. Promise the Lord. That stiff neck, stubbornness will never come back again. Promise the Lord. Otherwise, you'll not be able to enter the final land of promise. You'll not be able to enter heaven. Don't delay. Move in. Don't delay. Move in. Give God the first place. The priority. Make him number one. Let ego die. Let self die. Make God number one. Yes, the Lord will do it. The Lord thy God will circumcise your heart. And the heart of thy seed. That thou mayest love the Lord. Your God. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. That thou mayest live. Otherwise you will not be able to live. That thou mayest love the Lord. Above yourself love the lord above every other thing on earth love the lord above your convenience love the lord above your personal ambition love the lord at all times in all things above everything on earth that's what a circumcision does. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I knew that's the kind of payment you are likely to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be careful you are not sleeping, standing. You might fall down. Then people say you have evil spirit and it's not evil spirit, it's sleep. Don't sleep while standing. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word. Thank you, Lord, because of faithfulness to the word. Truthfulness in the word. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, you've called us to circumcision. The older generation that was circumcised of the children of Israel because of murmuring, because of complaining, and because of the moral flaws in their lives, and because of waging war against your way, against your statutes, against your servants, and against you. They've already perished in the wilderness. Here is the younger generation. About to move in into the land of Canaan. And then you have ordered, you have commanded that sharp knives be made and that everyone be circumcised before they can move in. And as, as soon as they did that, then you provided corn 
And then the captain of the host of the Lord appeared. Lord, what a glorious appearance that is. We're asking, Lord, we'll have the same experience in Jesus' name. We're praying that this circumcision will be real in every heart, every life. And Lord, when we're circumcised, the stiff neck is gone. The stubbornness is gone. And if there is anyone around us, nearby, a lady or a man, we can't say a brother or a sister, that after hearing all this, will still manifest the carnality or the stubbornness or the stiff neck. Oh Lord, help us to dissociate ourselves from every lady and every man like that in Jesus' name. And then even the look on our face, even the stench we take, will make those people know that they are odd. That they are not spiritual. That they are carnal. That they are following the devil. They will be ashamed of their ways. Lord we pray. That this scripture. That you have opened for us. Will become a reality. In every one of our experiences. In Jesus name. And there will be no leader here. That will encourage stubbornness no leader here man or woman will encourage stiff neck will applaud and praise and celebrate carnality anywhere we see that kind of action carnality every one of us was united force will crush it out so that lord has lifted us up to the throne of glory. And you want us to possess the land before us. This generation will not fail. The older generation of the children of Israel failed. They couldn't enter into the land. Lord, this is our chance. Lord, this is not the first church in our country or continent. Other churches have been before us. Great, powerful churches. But now, where are they? The older generation of churches. And now you've raised up this young church. Lord, we pray, will not repeat the same carnal mistake. Of the old churches in Jesus' name. How did West, uh, Wesleyan Methodism die? How did all these churches of John G. Lake, where are they? How did they die? All the charismatic Pentecostal churches, where are they? The churches before us, why did they fizzle out? Where is the older generation? And this is a younger generation. And you are telling us, this is our chance to move in into the land of Canaan. Are we going to repeat the same mistake of the Methodist church, the old holiness church, the Lutheran church, the Pentecostal churches, and then die out? Lord, are you going to raise up another new church again? Lord, we pray you'll call us back to our senses in Jesus' name. And Lord, for the sake of the perishing multitudes outside, and you are preparing us so that we can take this gospel in its purity, and take it to the people of the world. And then you can manifest your power. Undiluted power. And get souls saved in their millions. And get them healed in their millions. And get them delivered in their millions. For the sake of the perishing souls. Oh Lord, cleanse every one of us. Sanctify every one of us in Jesus name. Lord, we pray. 
Not all these little, little things that show carnality and stubbornness and unsanctified, uncircumcised heart will not remain in this place. For the sake of Christ, for the sake of his agony, for the sake of his blood he shed, for the sake of the perishing multitudes, for the sake of the work you have for us to do, that you will not be on this mount of transgression, killing mosquitoes, chasing after rats. When we have an elephant before us, when we have a nation before us, we have a continent before us that we are to possess. Lord, help us to drop all those useless little things that amount to nothing and go after the great ministry you have committed into our hands in Jesus' name. We are praying, oh Lord, even when we finish here tonight, we'll go on our knees again and we'll go in the presence of the Lord and then we'll think over and then meditate again on what we have heard and you'll do this work until it's completed in every heart. Let the fire burn in our soul and lead us, Lord, to higher ground. And let holiness be our watchword. Let it be at the center of our lives, at the center of our conversation, at the center of our relationship, at the center of our ministry, at the center of everything that we do, that we'll see holiness everywhere in this camp, in Jesus' name. Confirm it to Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.